Hello, this is Paul Johnson with The Optimistic American. Today, we are going to talk about the subject of forgiveness. Now, love and forgiveness is an interesting subject, and it's one that Dr. Bash and I have talked about in the past. As you know, The Optimistic American, we exist to try and help rekindle the American spirit. But there are big divisions that have happened in the American public today, and we're having to address those. We're having to deal with them. Dr. Basha has spent significant time dealing with people who have done incredible things, oftentimes not good things, uh, based upon the idea of non-forgiveness. We're going to talk about that subject today, uh, and it's at the end of this season where we've been talking about reform, because a big part of the reform is going to happen inside of each one of us. Now, we always appreciate people who go to optimisticamerican.com backslash premium and that sign up. But we also appreciate those people who just push that subscribe button. Or for that matter, we love those people who comment, even those people who sometimes leave some pretty nasty comments. We learn from all of them. We read all of them. So we may not respond to some of the nasty ones just because we don't see how it's going to help anybody. But we definitely learn from them as we begin to understand them. So participate. Take part. Now, here I am with Dr. Emily Basha. Dr. Basha, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Paul. All right. So um, what I'd like to try to do today is I'd like to start by focusing on both the, the psychological and the uh, maybe the physiological uh, benefits to love and forgiveness. Yeah, what research has shown us is that those who have difficulty forgiving or letting go tend to see that there's higher levels of stress. And that impacts the body, it impacts their physiological functioning, it has effects on their brain functioning, um, and there are important psychological effects that can be detrimental long term to holding on to that, not letting go and not forgiving and holding on to resentment or hate. Yeah, so stress and uh, stress and the idea of non-forgiveness seem to be very similar or almost the same from a neurological standpoint. Yeah, neurological and physiological and even psychological perspective. Okay, so... Um, here's something that's interesting, I think, to both of us. You and I uh, have written a book where we took a look at uh, genocides that have happened around the world, and specifically one that happened in an area where your family came from, Iraq. Um, but what's important in that is that you know we lost, in the 20th century, we lost over 100 million people to murder. We lost over 250 million people, arguably, to just genocide. And yet in the United States, we get angry over a tweet. What's happening today, and, and this is definitely a change since when during the period of time when I was mayor almost a couple of decades ago now, um, during, that, during this period, people, they're getting angrier, and they're generally angry at a party or at a person. In fact, they're not just angry. Oftentimes, they hate them. Uh, that definitely seems to have a big effect on what is happening to them psychologically. Yeah, and what we see also physiologically is that non-forgiveness, which is equated to stress, um, releases norepinephrine, cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and adrenaline. And so it keeps your body revved up and it impacts the nervous system. So it makes your immune system uh, not as strong uh, or resilient to fight against the effects of disease. Uh, the leading cause of heart attacks is stress on the body. So there are also numerous psychological, emotional, and neurological effects. So the blood isn't rushing towards the frontal lobe of the brain, which is the seat of higher order functioning and metacognition. So we're not able to think through and problem solve and be able to reflect on our impulses rather than acting upon the impulses and really think through consequences and decision making. 
all of that is really relied upon us being able to think calmly, rationally, logically, not really acting upon impulse when we're in this fight, flight, or freeze response, which is what's happening when our stress hormones are activated. Okay, so let me just ask a question. So I, I, I think about this. Uh, let's just say it's your boss. Let's say that you hate your boss. Uh, we know that, I mean, we've seen all types of, of uh, s studies and research that's based upon real data where like literally you can talk to someone about their mother and then their, uh, maybe their sister and a family member and you'll see a nice even set of waves that are coming across the, the scanner. But the minute you begin to see, or the minute you begin to talk about someone they hate, maybe their boss, you'll see a dramatic shift. So it is like uh, you'll it uh, hate can be oftentimes like stress. Now we know that if you do that over a long period of time, that that begins to have a deepening effect on you. Meaning, if you hate someone for five minutes because you're watching a movie or or you get into an argument with them, it probably has less of an effect on you than when something is prolonged. Now, it's one chronic of, stress. Right. And there, to me, there's a chronic stress that's developing today because of our politics. Mm -hmm. The fact that the media is constantly focused on the two bickering sides and the two medias or three medias have all picked a party that they're a part of attacking the other side is creating prolonged stress um, amongst individuals. Have you seen a real effect from this from a clinical standpoint? Well, yeah, if, if a person is operating from a perspective of heightened perceived threat, then they, they may be more volatile in their responses, um, and it may fuel that psychological resentment and that deepening hate and often serve as a legitimacy for them to become aggressive whether it's verbally or physically hostile, um, because underneath it all, they are feeling this heightened sense of threat. Um, and the hate just will fuel that and propel it into rage. And that's where people will often say, I just saw red and I, I, could, I had no control over my behavior at that point. And I didn't know if I left the person alive or dead by the time I was done beating them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I often will hear those kinds of stories. And sure, they could be left with... These are with, stories from people in your clinic or people that you're visiting in jail and you're doing evals? Or yeah, what? oftentimes when I'm doing those deep psychological... Uh, evaluations where I'm with a person in jail uh, because they're being tried for murder or uh, other uh, crimes, serious crimes, then um, I'm spending about seven hours with them in jail and really doing a deep dive into their life and their psychology and what really caused them to do what they had done. So I won't do too deep a dive because I know mm -hmm. that you can't talk about clients' names or mm -hmm. you have to even be careful about uh, characteristics. But are you seeing people today uh, that are in jail or prison that have done those types of horrific things that were caused by today's political issues? I think it definitely exacerbates it. And you might have somebody that might be more primed or have some of those vulnerability factors that could be more influenced by what is happening today politically. Um, and because of that, it's just propelling them into that space where they're more likely to aggress because they really are angry and they hate and there is no place for forgiveness or love. Okay, so have you seen people who have been directly affected by today's politics and have taken action that maybe caused them grief or their loved ones grief uh, because of their hatred or anger? Yes, absolutely. And even if, you know, asking them questions today about what what it was that was fueling their behaviors. Um, oftentimes they'll say to me, if they had the opportunity, they would do it again. Like there's just no remorse uh, and no appreciation of seeing um, the, the harm that they caused in their actions. And in their mind, it's totally justified. You know, the uh, 
I, I often talk about Martin Luther King. I, I love Martin Luther. Um, but he had in one of his sermons this, this, uh, this talk about the different types of love. Uh, the Greeks had seven different types of love, but he narrowed it down to three. And one of them was eros, which was a romantic type of love. Uh, then there's philia, like the city of Philadelphia, brotherly love. Um, but the one that was the most divine was agape. And that was actually, it was divine because you were loving people that oftentimes were your enemy, people that, that, you, uh, that had done something wrong to you. What I find to be fascinating about that, I mean, clearly that was a good political strategy because, again, when you're walking up that bridge in Selma, uh, one side's up there shouting names and epithets and they're, they're shouting uh, derogatory words at these, uh, the people who were marching for civil rights. And had they've just responded with the same, the public would have listened to it and said, well, I don't really know who's at fault. Um, second, Martin Luther said, hey, people know how to respond to hate. They're pretty good at that. It's, it, there's not as good a defense to love. But what I find the most interesting about it is how that concept is self-healing. The idea that you forgive someone, that oftentimes you end up in better in a better position than the people you're forgiving. Yeah, and that's the biggest proponent of healing and doing that deeper inner therapy work. And I often will explain in therapy that, you know, don't think of forgiveness as a pass and saying to um, the aggressor or the offender that what they did was okay. That is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is really about saying, I'm choosing to let this go. And maybe there's some understanding that I'll never really truly appreciate. But I don't want to allow this bitterness and resentment to cripple me and handicap me because it is hurting me and it is toxic. And I often will say to people, it's like wishing that your enemy would take the poison, but instead you're the one that's taking the poison instead because that resentment is akin to drinking the poison. Yeah, and it's also a, uh, you know, I, I'm constantly thinking about the future, sometimes to my own detriment. I'm, uh, I could live a little more in the present at times, but I'm constantly thinking about the future. Where is it that I want to go? To me, hatred and, uh, and being unforgiving, it ties you to the past. It ties you to a problem or something that happened long ago. And again, as you said, I don't think that you have to, you know, there are, I have family, I have a huge family and I, I love all of them, but there are a couple of them that are pretty hard for me to be around and, and they, are, they can be very, very negative. But what I found is that if I just forgive them and let it go and try to be understanding, I may not hang out with them as much as I do others. I, I don't necessarily have to be around them constantly, but at least when I am, it's, it's easier on me. It's easier on the people around me who I do care about and that who I, I want to make certain that their lives are good. Yeah, and you often say don't give up on people that you love and that you know or that are in your family for people that you don't even know. And what that means is if you're, if you're going to be betraying your family or distancing or estranging yourself from your family or people that you love for some ideology and – you know, really, it's about a value construct that you're defending. Um, what are you giving up on? And family may be all that we have left who's willing to stand in our corner when we're battered and we're ugly and we're penniless and we have nothing left to give. And, and really, and, and family could be comprised of people that you've created to be in, in your world, in your household. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be your biological family, but really understanding and appreciating who am I turning my back on because of some figment of my imagination or yeah, some ideology or construct. I see it in my family uh, all the time, and I've certainly seen it amongst friends um, who, uh, you know, they'll, they'll make a comment. And the comment, it can be by either side, so I don't want to say this is necessarily more the left or more the right. Um, but it might be someone from the left saying, uh, well, I can't forgive them for being a Trump voter, right? And it's – and it, it, first it amazes me that you would hold – that you would 
let go of someone that you love and that you care about for somebody that you don't even know. That to me just seems silly. But more importantly, um, you, you're putting yourself in a position where you're allowing your politics to overrule the things that are the most important in life. Look, we have to have politics. If, if we're going to go decide, are we going to participate in the Ukrainian war? Somebody has to make a choice. Best people that make the choice are people we vote for. And the public may be divided on it. I mean, I'm obviously a supporter of it. It seems like a majority of the public is today. But in a democracy, like it or not, a majority has the right to be wrong. But that's our politics. It's the reason that we delegate that to representatives is so that we're not all involved in a daily squabble about those types of issues. There are things that are just quite simply more important. And where we participate and take part in building a greater society to a much larger degree than our political opinions, what we're building, our job, uh, what we produce, the product that maybe we create, our innovations, the fact that we have people that we love and take care of and that depend upon us for nurturing and their care, all of those things, you're making a much bigger contribution to not only the meaning of your own life, but to where it is the society is going than your political position. Yeah, and that you know begs the question, what are your deeper values um, beyond political ideology? Like even deeper than that. And don't give up on those deeper values um, for some other kind of ideology. Right. And I think a lot of times people think, well, gosh, if I, if I give in on this argument, this political argument, somehow or another, I'm weak in my own values. You don't have to give up on your values. You can just be kind to someone mm -hmm. when, uh, when maybe they're not treating you with the utmost of kindness. Yeah, one thing that I do, especially if I'm talking to somebody that you know I'm in disagreement with, is seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Yeah, one of the seven habits. And that was one of the Wonderful things book. we talked about. <clears throat> but the other thing I might do is, what are they really saying to me? Not what I hear, not the content, but what are the themes of what are they really trying to say to me? And maybe it's really about their own insecurities. Once I get that, it helps me to understand where they're coming from. And then I can feel compassion for them, even if I disagree with them. And for compassion and disagreement to coexist is akin to wisdom. I think you're, you're achieving something higher then. You know, I find it fascinating that a very long time ago, they were, they've been, they were talking about this issue of forgiveness, right? It, it's, it's in the Torah. It's in the Quran. It's in the Bible. It's, uh, you know, you'll find it whether you're talking to your priest, your pastor, your rabbi, for that matter, your yogi instructor, right? It's, it's, it's been around for a long time. And interestingly enough, as stacked as it is into most religions, I find it fascinating that that people have a hard time connecting to it through their religion. Yeah, interestingly, we're having this episode on the time we're embarking upon Yom Kippur. So in Judaism, it's the Day of Atonement. So we've just celebrated our new year. Following the new year, we're supposed to fast for 24 hours. Um, for our sins so that we can start the new year fresh. And it's really a time of reflection. It's looking back on your sins. And you're supposed to ask for forgiveness mm -hmm. from people that you've slighted or hurt, even people you love and also your enemies. Yeah, well, it's at least in the Lord's Prayer, it's give us this day our daily bread and forgive me my trespasses and help me forgive those who have trespassed against me. Right? It's, it's recognizing that that's a two-way street. It's important to be forgiven. But usually you need to be forgiven for something you did to someone else. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is more divine to make certain that you're forgiving them as well. Yeah, it reminds me of a story, actually, of my grandfather uh, where there were these children. It was during a very volatile time in, in Baghdad where the Jews were directly persecuted. Um, and there were some children in the neighborhoods and they were vandalizing my parents' house or my mother's house. And they were taking the fruit off of his trees. 
and they were calling him names and, you know, dirty Jew. And he walked out of the house and he was watching them. And these were only children, but yet they're a reflection of what was happening in this society. Um, he handed them a basket and he said, here, let me help you. And he pulled out some of the fruit and put it in the basket to give to them, to help them pull the fruit off the tree. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of yelling at them and being mad at them, which would have been warranted, uh, you know, he, he found a way to find compassion in his heart and say, no, I don't want them to think of us in this way. Let me change their narrative. And I can only do that through this relationship that I'm helping to foster right now. So again, I, I think this is something that for it to work, you have to practice it. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing, what, what all of us are witnessing today in our environment is a daily barrage of negative news, negative information that really is kind of telling us who we should hate. And that's transferring over not only to the people that we're watching on those programs, but to the people that support them. So how do you break from that? Well, I've seen you do this over and over again with some of your political enemies. I think you have some stories, especially McCain. I love that story. Um, Fife Symington is good, but I, I like the McCain story. That one's really powerful. Well, in both cases, I, I have to give more the McCain. Uh, the, so McCain and I and Fife and I obviously were pretty bitter political enemies. Uh, I'm an independent today, but I was a Democratic mayor at the time. And uh, they were worried about me running against them or running against Fife. And, and as it turns out, I actually was going to. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, they, uh, there were times that, I, th that we were in some pretty bruising battles. And so I put them on kind of my, my no-like list. Um, it, certainly McCain, you know, he, McCain came over to me and ended up uh, sticking out his hand and asking – me to forgive him for past actions, which, you know, then after I thought about it, it was like, well, I think I deserve, I, I owe you as much an apology, certainly, as you owed me, because I wasn't all that nice either. Symington was uh, set up uh, from, for me by a friend who says, hey, I want to get the two of you guys together. Now, here's the most important part. We don't think alike. We just don't, right? I, I think differently than Fife and John McCain. Thank God. Right? Both of those two have given me incredible gifts through their wisdom, through their insights, through how they see life. And, and again, we don't have to agree, but I really made a focused decision to try to understand them and to understand where they were coming from. And my life benefited from it in a huge way. I would tell you that oftentimes when you're in these fights with people, your first thought is, I have no desire to get anything from them. You're missing out. You're just missing out because everyone has gifts to give. Yeah, and I mean, an extension of McCain's story I'd love for you to share is what he taught you about forgiveness um, and how he forgave his captors. Oh, well... Look, McCain was uh, McCain is maybe one of the most special individuals that I ever met, and I think most of the people that knew him would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Certainly, he was in a prisoner of war camp. He was treated brutally. Uh, when he came out, I mean, he told me when he shook my hand, he says, "Hey, look," he says, "I was in a prisoner of war camp, and I just kind of had this idea of I have friends and I have enemies, and if you're an enemy, I'm going to do everything I can to go after you." And he said that wasn't fair to you. And he says, "I just want you to know I'm sorry." Um, but when I spoke to him later on, he said one of the, the pivotal points in his life was when he forgave his captors. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, there's a lot on that very, very subject. There's a, a great book called Unbreakable where uh, a guy who, was in, who ended up in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, tortured on a, and, and brutalized on a daily basis, uh, ended up forgiving his captors, and it, and it changed his life. If you get a chance to read that book, it's great. McCain's story was very similar. His being willing to let go of that hatred had a huge effect on his life, and his telling me that story had a huge effect on my life. I kept thinking, well, who are these people that I met at over political partisan reasons that don't even come close to the to the people that he's been willing to forgive. And, and I, to me, that's really the whole lesson of what we're talking about here today. Look, we've, 
you and I have been in some sites and in areas around the world where people have brutalized one another in, in horrific, horrible ways, ways in which you would think could never be forgiven, Rwanda, Cambodia, uh, in Bosnia. And, and what's clear to me is that this whole red-blue thing, we're, we're way too carried away with it. It's not that big a deal. The divisions that we have here aren't nearly as big as we're making them. Now, there are people who benefit, who profit from making them bigger, who, from a political standpoint, they're going to win their primary if they can just convince the, the small group of people who vote in their primary that they hate the other side more than anyone else does, or the news media that have figured out that by going after the other side, ensure them an audience, a, a niche that's going to keep watching their show. The answer is they're making it bigger than it really is. We're all people, and we're Americans. And as Americans, the one thing I am absolutely positive of is that we have a lot more in common than we have that separates us. And I would encourage people, go look at other places around the world where it didn't work. It usually didn't work because they had massive divisions, but divisions that went much deeper and much farther than anything that we've experienced in the United States. Yeah, that's very true. There's a lot to be grateful for, especially after traveling to Bosnia and really learning about um, the tensions and the, the ethnic conflict, ethnic-based mm -hmm. conflicts and racial conflicts that exist there. It just really puts into perspective um, the conflicts that we have here and, and makes me very gr uh, grateful and, as well as optimistic. All right, so gratitude certainly important. We've talked and about compassion. talked about forgiveness, compassion. Any last pieces of advice when you're facing that person that just has you so mad you boil? Yeah, I think I think compassion really helps and being able to rather than seeing yourself sitting across the table from your enemy, really try and align with them and envision yourself sitting uh, on the side of them, looking at the problem with them rather than feeling that they're threatening you personally. Don't personalize the threats. Depersonalize it. It has nothing to do with you personally. And I think once you do that, it'll help you step away and see things more objectively. If you can practice some compassion, it'll also help you to distance from the direct perceived threat, whatever that might be. And that's going to give you so much more psychological benefit and help to bolster resilience um, than the person that you're needing to forgive. Um, because the enemy on the other side, they're festering in, in their own rage. And as we know, that's going to cause long-term chronic stress and other damages. We also themselves. know absolutely for positive that oftentimes showing them why they're wrong, why their facts are wrong, or why they're not listening to the right expert, even if you're right, oftentimes doesn't matter with that person. It, it's a worldview. Listening, maybe you can get the worldview, and maybe with the worldview, you can have a better understanding. All right, Dr. Basha, thank you for being here. Again, I'd like to thank our guests. Again, you know, you can always uh, subscribe. We love having subscribers to our channel. We also Recommend for those who are interested to go to OptimisticAmerican.com backslash premium. Uh, and if nothing else, leave a comment. We're very interested in what it is that you have to say. Thank you very much. Godspeed. Paul Johnson and Emily Basha with The Optimistic American. Thanks for joining The Optimistic American Show. Help us grow by subscribing to our channel. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a like and a comment. There is so much more that we have planned, and we can't wait for you to embark upon this journey with us.